We're speaking now with Daniel McCann. He is the CEO of Precision AI. And we'll be talking about agricultural technology, the evolution of agricultural technologies and how that may help the sector and perhaps even bring down food prices. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the show. Welcome to Kitco. Good to speak with you at Collision 2022 in Toronto. Thank you very much. So Daniel, we're going to talk about your company. Uh, spoiler alert, you create a drone platform with in-house proprietary AI technology that helps farmers remove weeds. And uh, this has applications outside of agriculture as well. So we'll talk about that. But first, like I mentioned in the beginning, um, of the, in, in the introduction, food prices have been going up. Can you help us speculate as to why? Uh, well, a lot of reasons. So in addition to just inflation in general, a lot of geopolitical issues that are currently going on are driving up the cost of inputs, which of course drive up the cost of food. Uh, and it's not just that inputs cost more money, there's also massive shortages, which mean that you're, the farms are actually going to be producing less of the commodities out there uh, due to yield loss from, from these inputs. And so you, you've really got a perfect storm here. As an example, Russia is a major fertilizer producer around the world. And uh, fertilizer is very, very important to uh, the actual production of yield inside the crops. And so when you actually, because of the trade embargoes, when you, when you can't obtain the fertilizer like you want to obtain that, your yields are going to go down and the prices are going to go up accordingly. And unfortunately, despite the fact that there's lots of fertilizer producers around the world, to spin up the capacity to be able to replace what's lost by the Russian embargoes is something that just can't be done quickly. It takes years to do that. We can't just find a substitute for these fertilizers? There are a lot of different uh, emerging technologies that claim to be fertilizer substitutes or more efficient fertilizers. Um, unfortunately, they have the same scale problems that everything else has. So even though you can find alternative methods of doing that, because a lot of these things are so new, um, you, you just simply can't obtain them. Okay, so looking forward then, I think what everyone wants to know is whether or not the grocery bills are gonna stay high or continue to go up. Do you think these problems that you just mentioned are here to stay, or do you think they'll fix themselves rather quickly? Uh, I, I think they're gonna get worse, okay. to be honest with you. Um, so a, a case in point of, uh, it's not just fertilizer, it's also crop inputs. For example, uh, chemicals that protect crop. Uh, and uh, Deloitte once said that 60% uh, of the world's food yield is predicated on chemical-based crop protection. And so if you actually can't obtain uh, the chemicals to protect those crops, uh, pests are also gonna reduce that yield. So you've got the double whammy of less fertilizer and less inputs. Uh, so this year's yields are predicted to be much lower than previous years. Uh, and then paired with the fact that you've got geopolitical issues with a lot of countries that used to export grain are now becoming protective of their grain. Um, I think you're gonna see food prices continue to increase and, and fairly substantially over the next while. I wonder if this is gonna incentivize uh, local farmers or farmers in North America, I know you're based in Canada, uh, farmers in North America to start sourcing their herbicides and, and uh, fertilizers from, I guess, more domestic sources. Is that possible going forward? Unfortunately, um, unfortunately, I mean, a lot of these things are produced overseas, right? A lot of pesticides are produced uh, in Europe um, and, uh, you know, fertilizers again in Russia. Uh, there is capacity, but, uh, but again, to spin up that capacity is not something you can do overnight. It's going to take a long time to do that. So, uh, so sourcing them domestically isn't really a solution, unfortunately. So you mentioned that food prices could go up even more. Do you think we'll have a food shortage, though? I think in uh, the Western nations we won't, um, again, you, because you're seeing a lot of protectionism. Um, air, uh, co countries that would normally export grain are going to export less grain and, and hold on to their reserves uh, just in case this issue continues to become, become uh, a problem. Where you are going to see issues is in maybe emerging nations like places in Africa, like for example Ukraine. 80% um, of uh, uh, some of the African countries' imports of wheat came from Ukraine. Well, of course, you can't do that anymore right now. And that's going to create significant problems, especially if other countries aren't prepared to make up the shortfall through their exports. Okay. Well, let's talk about precision AI and uh, how your company fits into the global picture of agriculture. Uh, tell us how the technology works. Well, so what we do is our thesis is uh, you have to do more with less. And uh, particularly in light of this environment right now, we actually came up with this technology before the current geopolitical situation happened, uh, but now it's becoming even more prominent. And what that is, is there's a, a huge amount of waste uh, in current agricultural processes. So for example, weeds in a field will reduce your yield if you leave them on there. So we have to spray field for weeds, but only about 5% of the biomass of any given field is weeds, yet we spray the whole field. 
And so what that means is that you've got a critical business process used by virtually every farm that operates at about a 5% effective efficiency and represents 30% of their annualized input costs. Uh, even more now, now that costs are going up. Um, so this needs to change. Um, and so the, the focus of uh, where I believe the inflection point is, is that uh, our, the introduction of artificial intelligence and uh, automation on the farm is going to be a, the, the, the same type, if not greater, of a revolution as moving from a horse or an ox into a tractor. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about another industrial revolution, uh, an, another industrial revolution in farming. That's right, and it's coming. How does, uh, the, how does your system then differ from the current system of, uh, of uh, removing uh, weeds in the sense that uh, uh, the process and the, the, the time it takes. Tell us about the differentiating factors here. Yeah, so today, the way it works... I, mean, I, I understand there's a drone, and I, I personally, I love drones. But um, why do I need it is basically my question. Well, our thesis is that every farm, just like every farm is a tractor, going forward in the future, every farm is going to have a drone. And for a variety of reasons. Um, one, of the, one of the best reasons of that is because you can get bird's eye views of your farm in ways that you can't currently do that. So a lot of people don't realize that things like the proliferation of weeds aren't random. They typically have a statistical uh, distribution where it, it might be patches in certain areas of the field. So if you can fly up and get a bird's eye view of your whole field, you don't need to treat your whole field, you can only treat individual things. But we take that to the next level beyond that. What we can do is we have incredibly high resolution imagery, about two orders of magnitude more powerful than anything else. Right. And we can make out every individual plant in the field at a resolution that we can determine their actual species. So we can tell you within a centimeter of precision where every weed is on your field, and then create a delivery system that can deliver pesticide to only those weeds and nothing else. Okay, but don't, uh, don't weeds grow randomly? I mean, if you remove weeds from one place today, won't they when they sprout from another place, I mean, later and next week perhaps? I mean, it's, why not just spray the entire field is my question. It will, because you don't need to. Um, and so, so there, there's two answers to that question. Um, typically, uh, weed proliferation is based on what happened in a previous year, okay. right? So as an example, let's say you missed a couple of weeds in your last year's application, they've grown in and you go to combine your field. Well, those weeds have germinated. And when you take your combine over those weeds, you blow the seeds into a stochastical area around that. So next year, you're gonna get a lot of weeds around the area where previous year there were only few weeds. Um, and you'll get very few of those weeds if you go into a totally different section of the field. Um, so there is a certain amount of randomization, but you can control significant portions of those weeds by understanding what happened in previous years. Um, but even so, the idea of using AI to recognize the plant species and precision spray only the weeds allows you to create new technologies that don't exist today. So today, you're spraying the whole field. But again, only about 5% of the biomass is weeds. So even if you're going over that field with your sprayer or with a drone like what we create, uh, if you leave all of the nozzles off, unless you happen to be directly over top of a weed, right. you can reclaim almost 90% of the cost of what you're investing today. I suppose the farmers could also advertise their crops as being more, I guess, or uh, less touched by herbicides and a little bit more healthy to eat. Because some consumers are concerned about having too many pesticides and herbicides in their plants and fruits and vegetables. Yeah, and, and that's actually, that's a great point, and that's one of, the, uh, one of the key drivers behind a lot of global trade issues right now. So uh, the World Health Organization has defined what they refer to as safe chemical residues that leach into the food supply. So every time you do a chemical application, a trace amount of that chemical will actually get into the, get into the food. It's called maximum residue levels. And uh, it, it, what's happening in the world is, as you and I awaken to what we put inside our bodies, consumers are saying, well, I don't care what the WHO says, I don't want any pesticide in my food. So countries like the European Union are actually establishing their own unilateral standards saying, okay, if the WHO says parts per million, we need parts per billion or less. And so if you grow commodities uh, with that chemical residue, you actually can't trade them into the EU. Okay. And conversely, on the other side, if you can actually prove that your commodity doesn't have those chemical residues in it, you'll actually find downstream grain buyers willing to pay a premium for those commodities because it's, it helps them with their marketing of their, of their ingredients. So you're seeing a decommoditization of commodities right now, and, and this is going to be a trend that continues. Today, there's two classes of commodities. There's organics, and there's everything else. That's right. 
What you're gonna see now, and, and this is already happening, is you're gonna have organics, but then you're gonna have specialty commodities in the middle. They might not be all the way to organic, but they might be no pesticide residue, or they might be high protein content. How, how is organic defined today? Is it, is it any, any crops without the use of, uh, grown without the use of pesticides? Uh, it's more than that. Um, in some cases, it can be GMO. It, it depends on your certifying body. Uh, so no GMO, uh, no pesticides, using things like natural fertilizers. Um, you, have to, you have to have a multi-year data on your soil to ensure that there's no additional residues in that soil. Sure. Um, so there's a big certification process that's typically involved. That's, that's why organic food is so expensive. Let's talk about the cost of this technology. So first of all, what is the cost right now of, uh, of uh, spraying a field per acre in the traditional way? So it depends on what, uh, what your application method is. Uh, some are cheaper than others, and it depends what crop you have. Uh, but the range can be anywhere between, on the very, very, very low end, about $30 an acre or so, uh, up to $70 or $80 an acre for if you've got a specialty crop that requires a specialty chemical. Okay, so let's take, so let's take your drone that uh, pinpoints, surgically pinpoints specific areas to spray. What's the total all-in cost of operating the drone plus spraying those specific areas? Well, the, the advantage of systems like that uh, is that you can basically go up to a farmer and say, okay, right, what do you spend in chemical inputs every year? And you can tell them to erase that number and write in a number that's about 90% lower. So it, it's a very, very attractive value proposition for the farmer because it also doesn't impact uh, yield at all in any negative way. Um, so, you know, in a dollars and cents standpoint, um, you know, all in operating costs, we can save the farmer upwards of $63 an acre. $63 an acre. When you factor in things like fuel and assorted other things for driving the whole field. Yeah. Okay. And ultimately, do you think this will have a bottom line on food prices? Suppose every single farm adopts this technology. Just suppose. What's going to happen to our, to our crop uh, yield and crop price? Um, well, largely, I mean, it's a function of input output, right? If your input costs are high, which they are today and they keep getting higher, uh, farmers have to charge more on the other end for those crops, right? So if you can bring those input costs down, eventually it creates, you know, a, a less input cost means eventually less output costs. Okay, uh, this is just a statistic from uh, StatsCan. The average age of the Canadian farmer is 56 years old. Uh, the older you get, typically the uh, more conservative your views when it comes to adopting technology. So do you think that Canadian farmers and perhaps farmers abroad are willing to adopt this new technology? Uh, I think that's a, that's a little bit of a myth. Um, the farmers that we've spoken to are, you know, they don't get a lot of credit for being very astute business people, but they're very astute business people. And if you have a very clearly compelling value proposition, they are willing to try almost anything. Um, but they're obviously going to come at it from a, maybe a more conservative standpoint if you're in the older generation. Like maybe they won't give you their whole farm on year one, they might give you a part of their farm. I'm just looking at history. I mean, the tractor revolutionized the world, but it took a while for that to be accepted by people who are farmers were more ingrained in their traditional methods, let's say. That's changing. Yeah, that's changing. Uh, today, it's a, the economics have made it that it's dollars and cents matter. Every dollar and cent matters. And if you've got something that you can come in and dramatically reduce the cost, um, our experience has been that even you know older farmers are still willing to give it a try. I'm curious about the uh, drone itself. So you build not just the AI platform, but also the drone, right? Correct. And you, you don't outsource that to like DJI or anything? No, because the drone that we build um, is designed for broad acre farms. Okay. Um, the, you know, the total addressable number of acres out there, if you're dealing with wheat or corn or soybeans or canola, is so much larger than some of the specialty crops that drones operate on today. So are, are, you a, are you a software company or a drone company? We're both. We've got a, a fully unified platform. Right. So our, on one side, we've got the artificial intelligence systems and the flight control systems to go and cover a broad acre farm. Okay. On the other side of it, we've got the drone platform to be able to, to cover you know, a, a giant farm at very, very high speeds, which is actually very challenging to do. Uh, would you consider building these drones and uh, just selling them without the AI to, uh, to uh, any industrial user who, and then have them install their own software? No, it doesn't really work that way, unfortunately. Okay. Um, the, the drones are, are intended to be working with our, with our AI and our control systems in it. Okay, um, what if it rains? Can I, still, can I still fly the drone out there and scan my field? Yeah, well, if it rains or not, it, our solution is superior to ground sprayers that are used today because right. if, if, you're, if you've got a 100-ton you know, you know, machine that's going across your field and it rains, you're going to sink into the mud. Okay. If you take that process and you move it eight feet into the air, um, you can actually still spray your field even when it, after it rains. Okay. Um, how far are you into the capital raising process? 
So we have raised a, a previous round of capital. Um, we are going to be looking at raising another round of capital sometime soon. Um, it's uh, because of uh, obviously the total addressable market that we're, we're attacking, it's going to be a relatively significant round of capital. Past the seed round, no pun intended. That's right. <laughs> Uh, is it difficult to raise capital in today's environment? We're in a bear market for public equities and uh, venture capital is uh, also reflecting that in terms of sentiment. Are you seeing that? Are you feeling that? Yeah. So what's happening is, I mean, the venture capital index is down about 70 percent, uh, which is very, very significant. And it's making things very, very difficult uh, for a lot of companies. Uh, but it depends on your sector. Uh, the, the tech sector is getting gutted right now. But if you are an ag tech, um, largely you're immune to this because of the geopolitical issues going on in the world and the fact that it's an industry that is very inefficient and needs to be disrupted. So actually, if you're an ag tech company like we are, um, you're seeing things still continue on. But if you're, for example, an enterprise software company, it's a very challenging environment to raise money. Okay. So finally, tell us about the uh, future plans of your company. You've talked to me offline about some of the other applications besides agriculture. Uh, what other applications are you exploring down the line? Well, so what we do is our drone platform has integrated onboard artificial intelligence and computer vision. So which means it flies, it sees, and it thinks all at the same time without having to go back to you know home base or a server. So you can make real time in the air decisions about what you see. Today in agriculture, that becomes a decision about what's a weed and what's a crop. Yeah. Tomorrow, um, the applications of this are very, very extensive. So uh, one, uh, one example is uh, power line inspections for a utility. Um, you know, today in today's world, if you're using a drone to do power line inspections, you've got a lot of logistical challenges with it, with collecting millions and millions of images and then having to give them somebody onto a desk that thumbs through each individual image and 99.9% .9 of them are totally fine. With AI on a drone as an example, you can actually fly and the, and the computer itself can make decisions about what's good and what's bad. So you only send back data on the problem areas and nothing else. So it can be a game changer. And the drone itself, I'm just curious, what's the flight time on that drone? About two and a half hours. Wow, that's a huge battery pack. Yeah, well, it's the, we, we also uh, have options where you've got an onboard gasoline generator so it can fly for even longer than that as well, too. Um, if law enforcement or military were to approach you and say, hey, can you build a drone for a custom specialization, would you consider it? Uh, well, right now, we're focused on agriculture, but of course, if the right opportunity came along, we're entrepreneurs and we'll always look at any opportunity that comes our way. All right, Daniel. Best of luck with your uh, with the development of your company, and uh, thank you for sharing your story. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more.